Okay, so you can start by sort of introducing yourself, saying who you are, and then so I'm going to the questions. Okay, so I'm uh, Walter van Berdung and I'm a designer. Okay, so the first question I want to ask you is, from your perspective, the story of the Antwerp 6. Because a lot of people have kind of heard about it, but it would be good for you to say kind of what happened. Oh, um, the story of the Antwerp 6, it's a very spontaneous thing that happened back in the days, uh, in, the, um, in the beginning of the 80s when we were at school. Huh? and just graduated after school because uh, the whole uh, group, the Antwerp Six, where we were uh, studying together at the same moment in the Antwerp uh, Fashion Academy and um, a certain moment we felt also that we, we needed to, to get out of Belgium because we uh, did a lot of uh, contests here, we, we were very active, we were trying to, to, to really get our name on the yeah. Uh, in the spot uh, to, to, that they could talk about us, but we also realized very quickly that, that Belgium is, was very small because everything what we did here never went over the borders because there are not real, at that time there were no international magazines, the language was also like a big uh, problem, nobody was reading about us. And then um, we, uh, one evening we were really friends, we were sitting together a lot of times, having dinners, eating, going out and, and uh, and then one of uh, Geert Bulot, who was an owner of a shop, he said, why not try to go to London? And uh, London was at the designer show at that moment. And, uh, and then we, we spontaneously uh, took the decision to go together, to, uh, to hire a van, to go over collections inside, and we drove over to London. And then we were um, on, that, uh, on the British Designer Show, a big fair, presenting our uh, collections. And, um, and at the beginning it was very difficult, people didn't notice us, we were on the to 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 totally wrong uh, level between the, 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 floor, the, yes, the, the, yeah. the worst <laughs> position ever between brides, clothes and things. So, um, But then so, um, an assistant from a press agent in uh, London discovered us and the press agent was um, um, Ronishka was her name. And, um, and then, in fact, she, she took us all together, the six, into her press office. And, and the press called us the six of Antwerp yeah. because our names were so difficult to pronounce <laughs> that they preferred to say it that way. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, we, in fact, we were never intended to be a group, but by coincidence, it happened like that. And uh, yeah. Oh, great. And they called us so, that way. What would you say is the impact? of the Antwerp 6 on Belgian fashion? Well, I think that we put uh, the Belgian fashion on the map because it was not existing at that time. Eh? We were uh, uh, graduating in, uh, in, yeah, in, in Belgium, uh, but there was no fashion history, not really. There was a little bit, but very, very... And definitely there was not so much international attention for Belgium. And then by, by uh, working this year, at that, uh, that time, and uh, getting more and more attention, going international first to London and to Paris, and step by step, yeah, we were growing and getting more attention for Belgian fashion. Yeah, so I've heard from a good source that you say that Dirk Van Sané is a better designer than yourself. Is uh -huh. that true? <laughs> I mean, I have to say now yes, because. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think he's a very good designer, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And what do you like about his work? The reason I'm asking you is because I think most people are familiar with your work, with uh -huh. Adam Willemister's work, yeah, 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 Norton, yeah. Doug Bickenberg, but I think with Marina Yee and Dirk Van Sané, yeah. their work is a bit more difficult to find. Yeah. So yeah, I'd like yeah. to know, like, what do you like about their work and what do you think about them? But I think that he is, has an incredible uh, uh, possibility to work very elegant. He can, can translate every idea into a very elegant, beautiful way of wearing the clothes. So in fact, it's really making women very beautiful. You know that Dirk is my partner? I didn't know. Ah, you see. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. No, we are together since school. Yeah. So we are together for more than 40 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so next question I want to ask. Now mm -hmm. we're going to go, we've done the warm up and we're going to go deep into it. So, what are your ideas on ownership of sort of ideas? What are your opinions on that? And you mean ownership? In terms of like in fashion? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you mean rights of. of, of yeah. 
Yeah, what you can and what you can't. Yeah, exactly. What you yeah. can and what you can't do. Yeah, what yeah, are yeah. your opinions on that? This is one of the more difficult questions, I think, that uh, because um, I think the, if you work with respect, you can do a lot. And, and that's how I try to work a whole career. Because I'm incredibly fascinated by, by different cultures, by, by tribes, by, by how these people are treating and working with beauty. And, and it inspired me always a lot. But I never felt or I never thought that I was doing it in the wrong way. Yeah. So I never misused these people, I never was doing it literally. It was more a trigger for, to, to get my fantasy running. And that is, I think, if you work that way, with respect, with topics, you can do that and you should have the possibility to do it. Yeah. And, um, and I know that today it's very loaded and very sensitive yeah. <laughs> topic, but it's a little bit oversensitive yeah. also. And I think finding the right balance is more than ever important. Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, the conversation to me at least around cultural appropriation, the conversation we have is very limited. And I mean, in school, because I'm at school now, we sort of did a study on like the breadth of what it actually means to culture appropriate and just the fact that culture changes over time different cultures mix so what it means to be Japanese a hundred years ago is not it's the same thing now. as yeah, now yeah. so it's really hard to then decide yeah and also very important is also to see it in the right time frame because now things are happening which wouldn't have happened 20 years ago or 40 years ago because then also time was completely different yeah and people were acting and reacting differently on these topics also yeah. But I think the word respect is the best. If you work with respect in fashion, I think that you can handle a lot. Yeah. So what are your opinions on copying in fashion? Yeah, I hate copycats. <laughs> <laughs> I told it already very yeah. clear, a little bit everywhere. I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm telling this since the beginning of my career. I'm not telling it. <laughs> I repeated it recently. Yeah. But um, oh, that's the thing I really don't like and I, I really think it's very weak and also very unfair and, yeah. and, and, and um, I mean as, uh, if you want to be a serious fashion designer you really have to show your own identity, your right. own signature and also yeah. be proud of that. Yeah. And if you then are looking around to oh I need this and that and that and I'm gonna do that and that just because or you don't have the fantasy or the, the possibility to create in that way or you just want to copy it to sell more I think it's weak and it's also not a thing you do yeah. when you want to be taken serious in, uh, in fashion. I agree. So what are your opinions on sort of the way that... A good example is Demna Vesalia. Uh, with his brand Vetmore, there are many collections where he takes like the prints from what you'd see in souvenir shops in Belgium. What do you think is the, the thought process of people in Antwerp to that sort of thing? And how do you feel about it? Oh, I, I think it, we were rather flattered that, yeah. that he, because he already did that at school, yeah. eh? so it, for us it was not that new. Oh, okay. So when they were doing the, the, when he was graduating, he was doing with his whole class um, a magazine and also on the cover were very typical Antwerp ah. things, so for us it was <laughs> not so. Uh, and they were wearing even that kind of t-shirts at school. So for us it was just more like a repetition at Vedmont than something new. But um, yeah, we found it nice that he was like pointing out that he liked Antwerp and that he, that he liked to study here. And for us it was more like an homage to the city yeah. than just <laughs> copying the thing. Yeah, what this is where I'm trying to get to is what is the, and I ask this to a lot of designers just mm -hmm. to get their opinions. What do you think is the difference between copying, just outright copying and then referencing a piece, for example? Yeah. Again, a difficult question because um, I think homage of referencing you do again in a, in a very inspired way because you like the topic, you like the, the, the painting, you like it and you really are so overwhelmed or you love it so much that you want to do something with it in a way with respect again. Yeah. But copying is without respect, without uh, even thinking about the consequences or for the, the person that you copy uh, the consequences that you have also in fashion because it's also rather uh, I mean that fashion history has to admit that you're copying so it's, yeah. it's something that you do without even yeah, 
without respect. Yeah, it's huh? it's crazy how times have changed because if you look at the old couturiers, whether we're talking about Cristobal Balenciaga, there was a culture where you would copy other couturiers and then you get to a point where you find your own design language. Yeah, but and that's learning, that point, yeah? yeah? That's a learning process. Yeah. But I don't think that, I mean, fashion designers mostly learn in the years before they get uh, rather uh, known or when they really get started. And I think it's very important always to know what your self, what you are, your identity and what you're standing yeah. for. And, uh, and then, I mean, then you don't need to copy anything. Yeah. So when I think of your work, I think of there's many, so many different themes. There's themes of like sexuality, you've um, made a collection that's a commentary on like AIDS. Um, you've made um, like reference places from different regions. Like I know you're very inspired by like West Africa. You've referenced like Mali. For example, how important do you think it is for designers to be sort of cultural commentators? Yeah, I mean, we're coming back a little bit to the same yeah. stories <laughs> all the time. But it's again my fascination for this beautiful world. And, and, um, and, and I have to tell you honestly that today I'm also more, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm more careful of what I'm looking at, but it's, I find it also very sad because I have like hundreds of books with all yeah. these beautiful images from Africa, from Asia, from, from Europe, from everywhere. And, and it, for me it's a, it's a permanent joy just to watch through this beauty. And, and now I feel a little bit like they put something in front of my <laughs> eyes, you cannot yeah. look at this anymore because you are not... And that is such a strange it's a difficult, feeling. It's a difficult conversation, yeah. it really is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It really is. And, and now I sometimes even avoid certain topics, which I, I loved before, and, uh, and, and I try, I mean, I, I'm, yeah, I'm thinking also more before I take my decision. But of yeah. course I cannot deny my past, I really love it, I, I really keep on looking yeah. at it. Mali, I love the country, I've never yeah. been there, but I love the, um, the, the Bozo, they have uh, the sculptures, tribes, yeah. the tribes, I collect it also. Yeah. So for me it was also rather um, logic to, to, to work with it, uh, with respect to, to do some inspired things yeah. by that. So it didn't felt like I was misusing. Yeah. People. What would you say is your design process? A uh, very normal, very yeah. old, <laughs> old school. I think I'm I'm going through all the steps myself. So I'm I'm really starting from the beginning, doing research, um, sketching. Um, no, mostly research and and, and um, uh, watching on internet, doing uh, watching in books, going to museums and, and exhibitions, collecting um, ideas. And, and, uh, and then the, the next step is, is uh, for me mostly sketching, so I literally sketch yeah. also the looks. Yeah. And I meanwhile I'm working on the fabrics and I'm selecting the fabrics. And then I go in the next process is uh, working on the twelves together with my uh, pattern makers. And, um, and so I'm, I'm really doing the whole puzzle myself. Yeah. Of course I do it together with uh, uh, people that I'm working with uh, always, so I have like uh, assistants or even interns or uh, my uh, people who are constantly in the office and uh, but it's it's in the, the first place I, I I do all the steps myself I take all the decisions myself until the end so I also decide styling the makeup together of course with Inge we're working then but in fact I do it till the final thing also the ideas of the show yeah. so it's not that at a certain moment people are interfering no I, I, I come up with the idea I do the sketch and I tell the story on the catwalk or yeah the that's really good to know because I think now a lot of like big designers they get a lot of credit for their collections but they don't I know designers obviously I'm not going to mention their names that their interns do all the research they bring them the research yeah. and they choose what they like and those yeah, sort of things yeah. No, 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 of course they have that, that uh, this possibility also because I, I'm working in a very small scale. Yeah. Uh, I'm tiny, yeah? I'm tiny office, like not literally <laughs> tiny, but with a few small people, compared small to, yeah. compared to these big houses. Yeah. And, uh, but that gives me also a lot of flexibility. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm also spending a lot of time in, in, the, in design, the design process. And I also enjoy it a lot. Eh? Yeah. So it's, uh, it's, I do it also because I like it and that's why I'm putting all this time and effort in it. Yeah, so I read in an interview that you said that you feel like you're misunderstood. 
Why is that? Um, how it, uh, when did you read it? <laughs> because it depends a little bit from the context. Yeah, it was a bit of an, it was an old interview. Mm -hmm. I think you said generally about like your work and things you say that you tend to be misunderstood. Yeah, I think that that uh, I I was misunderstood in the past. Yeah, because I gained a lot of respect the last years, uh, the last ten years, I think. And, um, and, and I mean, before a lot of people thought uh, that, that I was a little bit like the, the crazy one <laughs> from, the, from the band <laughs> who was always working with uh, crazy colors and crazy subjects and that was a little bit how it was, my work was um, conceived or appreciated in, in the world. But um, I think over the years it's, it's changing and, and now they also realized one way or another that I was probably also rather important yeah. over the years in what I was doing because I did it in such a um, spontaneous, probably also overwhelming way that it was a little bit too much for certain people. <laughs> but on the other end I was always pushing boundaries. I was working with uh, gender 30 yeah. years ago, I was working with the with topics of the, the world and, and uh, uh, how we, we have to deal with it. it was doing that in collections like a long time ago uh, I was using different body shapes I, yeah. I, I mean I all did these things which are now so called very uh, which are now so yeah. important I can't remember what collection it was I think it was um, autumn winter 98 where you had a collection where um, the models were wearing these skin tight body suits and almost I think one was supposed to represent like a condom or something like that and it was about sexuality. Yeah, no, no, it was the collection which was referring to AIDS awareness. Yeah. And, um, and it was the first big show I did in, in Paris. Yeah. And uh, it was a shock because it, I was in between the normal fashion week, between the other designers which were doing rather serious yeah. menswear. <laughs> and I arrived there with uh, one, how many people, I don't know how many models, but 60 models probably all dressed in, in latex yeah. from top till bottom and then I put the collection on top. They were all masked also. Yeah. And uh, it was for me like uh, also like a, um, a statement about safe sex and about AIDS awareness. Huh? Yeah. And, um, and that kind of messages were always there. And, um, and I think now the, the last even like 15 years probably, I got a lot of respect from uh, also Bezia, who really want to collect my, uh, my pieces and who now also see the importance in the right. evolution of the menswear over the years. Yeah. And, uh, and also, the, I mean, I, I also, my clients grow also, the sell out is very good in the shop. So there's also like a lot of respect now for what I'm doing. That's great. <laughs> yes. So it feels what, also good. Feels yeah. also good. What spurred your decision to become um, sort of an educator at the Royal Academy of Fine Arts? Oh, it was on the invitation of one of my teachers. Teachers I had in school. Uh, she was after school. Even she became a friend. She was also always traveling with the six. We went everywhere. And um, and and a certain moment there was an availability in the school at uh, a place free. And she asked why not coming to teach and at that time I, I was already working on my own collection i was also working uh, on um, commercial work for a company in belgium and i said yes i i, I want to try it because i never had ambition to become a teacher it's a at one side is it also a rather boring profession i don't know <laughs> but i mean i didn't have the, the ambition but then i tried it and i never left anymore so I started in 1985 to teach, and I'm, I'm still very long time, long very long, long time. time. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I'm old. <laughs> but uh, and and since 1985, I'm coming two days a week to the school, very uh, very organized and very yeah. uh, strict. And I'm teaching uh, now. I'm teaching the third year, and I really enjoy it still. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because you're kind of known as an educator. I mean, of course, there's a story of Raf Simmons, which we'll probably get into later. And there's also a story of, I've read in interviews, Craig Green talked about how much you meant to him and how yeah, much you yeah, taught yeah, him yeah, and yeah, things yeah, like yeah, that. So yeah. it's quite interesting because you do have a reputation as an educator. Yes, and, and uh, I, I, I don't want to sound pretentious, but I, I'm rather good in it, I think. <laughs> and the, the nice thing is that um, when I have people around me, they easily get motivated because I have a kind of energy and I can show them that even with 
small company, small budgets, you can still make the difference and still do some statements. And that's what you, yeah, what you have to realize also, because it's, uh, I mean, it, Raf was motivated that way great. They were doing internships huh, in my place. Yeah. And they, they really went out and they, they had a kind of uh, energy, we can do it and we, we really can go for it. And that's what you have to get from uh, as a young designer. Somebody should show you that it is possible because otherwise you don't start up as an yeah. independent designer. Yeah, so how did your relationship with Raf Simmons come about? Because I know that's a big thing that a lot of people want to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, it's a, it's a nice. It, it started very, very sweet. <laughs> he sent me a letter um, asking for an internship, and um, then I replied, "Yeah, sorry, but you don't know anything about fashion." <laughs> so, <laughs> because he was an interior. He was interior design. Huh? He was on the other side of <laughs> yeah. Belgium in Hassel, uh, studying interior design, and um, but he kept on asking. I don't know. Uh, in which way I probably we met and then I saw that he really was extremely fascinated by, by fashion and that he, um, yeah, he, one way or another he wanted to go in that direction and then I said okay we're gonna, gonna try it and of course I let him do things he could do so in the beginning he was mainly working on, uh, uh, we did fairs at that time so presentations for the fair and and making small furniture and but I took him also with me to Paris yeah. we were together there and then we also went to fashion shows and I took him to Martin also to uh, uh, one of the, the first shows yeah that's the one with the children yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah. The, I don't know in the name but and, um, and and like that in fact he became really introduced in fashion and he also saw the possibilities and um, and then from one thing came another and he he stayed a long time with me because of the normal stage is like six months, but he came back and, and he, a few years he was there or he was helping out. And, um, and then rather uh, a few years after he started up his collection. Yeah, so something quite interesting and I'm going to ask your opinion on it is the Academy has an anniversary book. Yeah. And in that book, they talk about how the school has transitioned over time and it really went from a fine art school and then you had these lecturers who went to Paris to go and learn about fashion and how to educate and then they created the fashion course. Um, and this school is sort of known for being a school that taught fashion in a very artistic way mm -hmm. because you had artists who were trying to teach fashion and that's how the course started. So by the time you came, I think you were taught by Linda Lopper. No, 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 no. That's a misunderstanding. Ah, this is great. That's a, that's this a is big great. misunderstanding because uh, Linda was never our teacher. She graduated before us, uh, like okay. uh, 10, 15 years, but she was not back yet when we were studying. So our teachers were uh, Mevrouw Prichot, Mary Prichot, and uh, Mevrouw van Leemput. So we had two different teachers, yeah, which, which were the original teachers who started up the fashion department. Aha. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. if you're going to check it carefully, you're going to see that also, time-wise, it doesn't work that yeah. Linda was our teacher. Yeah, of course, because that's a big misconception. Which yeah, is why it's I a think misconception. Because, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, I, I try to, to correct it a few times, in, in, <laughs> but once a thing is out in the world, it's very difficult to change. So we were uh, teached by these two uh, older yeah. ladies, <laughs> women, and, uh, and the nice thing was, in fact, that uh, when we were at school, it was rather strict and the, the Frau Prichot, our head teacher, she was really, she thought she was an reincarnation from Chanel. So she looked like Chanel, <laughs> she was wearing like uh, the, 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 really the tailleur like yeah. Chanel. She was also very chic and very, the hair, rub and, and she had also that kind of, of um, um, that yeah, look on elegancy, which was really fighting with our visions. Because she said, yeah, a knee, you never can show a knee, and, and the elbow is an ugly place, and the <laughs> hair should be short. And, but I mean, we were in the middle of, of a, a period which was extremely exciting. When we were studying, we discovered first Italians with Armani and Versace, then the year after the French with Mugler, Montana, Gautier, um, yeah, who else? Then we had the Japanese coming to Paris with Comte Garçon and Yoshi Yamamoto. So it was an exciting fashion moment yeah. and everything was suddenly possible. There were so many individual statements by, by fashion designers that for us it was like, 
wow, <laughs> we can do whatever we want. And then she was there like, no. <laughs> so it created a nice, yeah, a, a rather strange vibe. But also, she, I think that way we kept a good balance between elegancy and experiment. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's so interesting because for a teacher that really gave you sort of rules to follow mm -hmm. in fashion, how different, like the Antwerp 6 for example, your aesthetics are, they're completely different. So yeah. how does that happen when you have teachers that are saying, okay, like the elbow, like nothing, <laughs> it shouldn't be open, like how does that happen? I think that the, the synergy between the group was more important than the teacher. Right. Because we learned from each other and we also, there was a lot of ambition. When Anne was doing something, Dries wanted to do it better, and then I wanted to do it even better. <coughs> so it was also like a very good synergy and good ambitions. And, uh, and we, uh, we were so excited and so happy to study fashion that we were also um, traveling around, going to, uh, to um, different places. We went together to New York, we went together to Japan two times. Uh, with the group eh, each time. So yeah, we I've were, heard stories, you kind of went on tour and you used to go to like gigs and stuff. Yes, we, yeah. I mean we <laughs> did so many things together and, and we discovered the world together and we discovered fashion together and that uh, I think that, that made us but it also gave us like extra wings almost because <laughs> everybody was so excited and, and, and everybody wanted to do it better so it was a nice ambitious uh, yeah. Yeah, that's Period. amazing. Yeah. So, how would you say the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in Antwerp differs from different fashion schools? Whether well, talking about like where I go, Central St. Martins or Bunker, yeah, or yeah, different yeah. schools. Yeah. What do you say different shapes? I cannot compare exactly because yeah. I don't know exactly how things are going. But I think uh, we we concentrate, uh, like you said, on creativity and on a very personal signature, and we also give the students we guide them that way. And, um, and for us, the most important is that they uh, really work very deep and intense in their own fantasy and in their own world, and that from there on, they're going to afterwards perform in fashion. Huh? So the, the thing is that we think that if you're extremely uh, creative, you can go and do all the different steps where you have to end. You never know where you end in fashion. Yeah. And if you are trained in a very industrial way or in a very um, yeah, more commercial way, you never can go to the top. Uh, we like people who can go to the top, but we also can work easily in all the levels yeah. that it's under it. And it was a choice uh, which we did, which I did together with Linda Lopa a long time ago, yeah. because it, it grew out of the how we were uh, teach and how it uh, evolved. And then after um, uh, Mevrouw Pijot, Linda Lopa came as head of the fashion department. And I was already there also. Yeah. So in fact, I was together with Linda all these years. And when she left, I took yeah. over the, yeah, the head of the department. Wow, that's so, so interesting, like hearing all these stories. And even, yeah, because a lot of people do think that Linda was a person that um, you, yeah, like no, no, she was very much involved and for a long yeah. time had, <laughs> but it was a generation, uh, she, uh, she was uh, teaching um, Demna in his last year, I was teaching Demna in his third year, so she was there for a long right. time. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was going to say, what do you think about sort of the new generation of designers that have come from this school, whether we're talking about Demna or Glenn Martin or yeah. Jimmy Potter, what are your opinions on how they've grown? Oh, I'm, I'm happy and proud that yeah. they are there and I think that uh, they're doing at the moment the most interesting statements in fashions and they really try to fight for to, to, to stay at one side independent or at least they, they, they keep their freedom to, to be creative and I think that's very nice to see. And, um, and, and of course, I mean, you, these are now the people that you're talking about. We have so many other ones yeah, which definitely. are working in all the teams a little bit behind the scene. Yeah. I think only in the Balenciaga are working probably 15 people coming yeah. from <laughs> here from the school. So there are so many people behind which are not really visible, which are also yeah, bringing out this uh, the yeah, that's where most designers go, even like Demna, for example, he worked at Margiela and worked at Louis Vuitton before. So yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. most designers will work within houses and make really good work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do we see that even 
after working a while in a house, some of them take the decision to go back to the, the yeah, their own collection yeah. huh? because a lot of them have the ambition to really make an own collection. Yeah. Okay, so going back to your work, what is your fascination with colour? Because you love to use a lot of <laughs> bold colours, bright colours. Yeah, I mean from day one, when I'm look, thinking back really uh, in my uh, childhood, when I was, uh, I loved colours, I always loved colours, I loved uh, the brightness of David Bowie as an artist, yeah. it was really the one that showed me that that fashion or clothing is communication and um, I really loved him for that and I loved his changements and his brightness yeah. and his uh, <laughs> makeups and, and his songs also so it was important that period was also a very colorful period huh? and, um, and, and even starting in the school um, I, I started to work from the beginning with colors it was something very natural very spontaneous which I really yeah, it, it's, even stronger than myself. Colors are always there. And if I say this season I'm gonna make a slightly darker collection, after two days it's already... <laughs> <laughs> Other colors are <laughs> getting yeah. in. Because I, I love to work with colors. And I, I put a lot of time in, in choosing the right colors. Yeah. Because from the, probably from the eye side, ask. it yeah. looks that it's always the same colors, <laughs> but no, they're always slightly different or I, I put a lot of, of uh, time and energy in choosing the right vibe of colors, the right energy of colors. Also how I put them together, it's rather yeah, important for yeah. me. And, uh, and yeah, it's also asking a lot of energy from me because I'm dyeing most of my fabrics myself. Yeah. I'm weaving a lot of fabrics. Wow. I, um, uh, the prints, I do them all, especially in, in my colors. So it's also very demanding. It's much yeah. easier to say we go for black. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's... Uh, yeah. but, but anyway, I, uh, I always love to work with colors. So what, what's your opinion on color theory? Do you reject color theory? Or ah, okay. It's like, it's almost down to a science. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 No, no, I know, I know. And I know these books also yeah. with all these theories, but I never call it color theory. Yeah. So, but, um, <laughs> I, I, again, I do it spontaneous, so I don't need, I don't yeah. need work with the systems. It's, I can feel when colors are on the right vibration, or I don't right. know how to and say it. And it's just a feeling. It it's just a you. feeling, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and also, meanwhile, the, uh, I'm working with uh, Pantone textile colors mostly, and uh, yeah, there are like, like thousands of colors, but meanwhile, I can already call the colors by name almost, so I know that Blazing Yellow and Placid Blue and, and Flame Scarlet, that are the names from Pantone, but I really use it in my, my communication also when I'm working yeah. with uh, my, uh, my assistants and in the studio we use really words which are referring to these colors. Yeah, so in your collection, something I've noticed over the years is when you cover like very serious topics, yeah. you sort of take an optimistic approach. Yeah. Why is that? Oh, I can tell you from who I learned it. <laughs> because I, I'm extremely um, excited and, 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 uh, and, and fan from um, Paul McCarthy, okay. the artist, yeah. and Mike Kelly. Yeah? So they are two artists, American artists, which in fact I discovered a long time ago. They, I discovered their first installations or their art pieces. And, and I was always so excited to, to see it and enjoy it in the first moment and then by reading about it or, or even he, uh, seeing the explanations it were mostly very loaded topics but the first impression was wow <laughs> so much fun so much joy but then you, you were reading about the most extreme topics and, and in fact I found it very interesting that you can, can uh, show through a very uplifting image a very serious uh, yeah. topic and um, and I did it again from the beginning in my collection I was re really using that kind of 
of mechanic, yeah, of I don't know how to call it differently, and, um, and 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 even sometimes people don't realize it, which is also yeah. good because <laughs> I don't you or, or I don't anybody to wear very loaded pieces. I don't yeah. that, that with messages of <laughs> of death, and that's not what what you want to wear. So in fact, the most of the people are wearing a colorful T-shirt. Yeah. But when I then can start to talk with press or doing interviews, I can also talk about uh, what is behind and what is uh, what I want to tell with that. Yeah, probably one of the most asked questions that my audience asks me is, how do you become a successful designer? So, I mean, in your opinion, and what success means is, it can mean anything, but in your opinion, as someone that teaches students, you've taught a lot of successful students, you yourself are a successful designer, what would you say to that? question? Oh, never <laughs> give up the hope, <laughs> because it's very unpredictable and it has so much to do with um, people you get to know, people who are reacting on your work, people that are, are, are supporting you and, and you never know if these things will happen, will not happen, so it has not only to do with, with um, with uh, really being the best one or, or to try to be the best one or with talent. It has to do with how everything is evolving. And uh, in my case, I mean, I, I, in my career, I, uh, I'm making collections in 1985. Yeah. Right? So every season <laughs> there is a collection one way or another. But I mean, I went like this and down and up and like a roller coaster. Yeah. That was my career. And, and in certain moments I was also desperate not having possibilities, not having money, breaking contracts, restarting <laughs> from scratch, uh, refinding my own identity, uh, being copied, to restarting, uh, all these things, it's, it's, it's also rather difficult. But one way or another, I always kept on believing. And, uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm now in the moment a little bit on an up, but I mean probably next week, <laughs> like Heidi says, next week you're <laughs> out. It's, um, it's very unpredictable, but I think the, the, you have to be patient, which is sometimes very difficult because people want to be instant famous. Yeah, which never happens. Which no is not no happening. You have, to be, you have to be skilled, you have to yeah. be prepared, you have to be strong, you have to believe in it, so all these things, and then you can probably talk about success. In your opinion, what are the most important skills for a fashion designer to have? To every, everything what I just said, so it, it's very important to, to know enough and to, to I think, uh, I mean, also our students, we want them to, to make the garments, to construct the patterns, to, to fit together with the teachers, to uh, learn, to understand, because that's what you need to know, the base of how you make garments is extremely important. You have to know about fabrics, you have to know what fabric you have to choose to make the design. Um, so all these steps, also the, the construction of garments, it's extremely important to know how this is done because like that you can also do changements and corrections and, and, and talk with the pattern makers how it could eventually be changed. So it's uh, first of all you have to have to know, have a lot of knowledge and then you have to have a lot of, um, how do you say that, uh, uh, chance, uh, don't find the word. <laughs> anyway, yeah. you have to be patient and, and then eventually successful. Like patient, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So, what's your opinion on fashion critics? People that criticize collections and those sort of things? I think that they're sometimes very short sighted. Yes. Yeah. I agree with you, I agree with you. I just want to know yeah. your opinion. Because though. sometimes I say, ah, they like this, why do they like it? And, and why they don't know that it already was done in a better way before. So it, <laughs> I think that uh, if you criticize, you also have to know the past yeah. and where we were coming from and what uh, the designers did at that time. And, and then you can probably start to criticize. But yeah. yeah, I think my, my approach as a fashion journalist is to sort of explain the themes that exist mm -hmm. in the collection mm -hmm. and then let the audience decide if they like it or not. Yeah, 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 yeah. So but that's more like description yeah. or, yeah. or uh, talking about it, yeah. I do like also, I mean, I, I do like, for example, to read the reviews from, from uh, Tim Blanks, yeah. from, um, um, oh, I'm, I 
really forgetting names. Susie Menkes. Yes, Susie Menkes. No, no, Susie Menkes, Tim yeah. Blanks. That are the critics I like to yeah. read because I think they have such an incredible background also, and um, and and they don't obviously have to do it to please somebody yeah. or to to show somebody that they are have an opinion. Yeah. And that are the <laughs> best opinions, of course. I agree. I think a lot of fashion journalism is just having an opinion just to have an opinion. It's yeah. sort of, I feel like maybe in the 90s you can speak better because I wasn't really born then. It seems, reading reviews from the 90s, it seemed as though a way to show that you knew about fashion was to criticise it and sometimes to criticise it unfairly. But how do you feel about that? Yeah, oh, I don't know, but I mean, the, the 90s were different. Eh? You had to read this, otherwise you didn't know about it. Eh? Because it was, you yeah, could not... No internet, and, yeah. no internet <laughs> nothing. So, the, 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 you were reading really about collections in magazines, which came out months after the actual launch, eh? in you know, the actual shows. So it was a completely different dynamism and energy, which was going on in... Uh, and, and, um, but I, d I don't remember the difference of what... Yeah. But it was also Susie Menkes, eh? so yeah. who was there, so <laughs> <laughs> she was already there at yeah. that time. Yeah. yeah, okay, so earlier you talked about copying, and I think, when was it, was it last year? There was a big controversy around like Virgil Abloh and his Louis Vuitton collection, I think. Um, so what are your general opinions, because now it's amazing that I'm asking you this question because it's sort of died down, you probably had a longer time to think about whatever the situation was. So what are your thoughts on that? Oh, that's something I don't want to talk about. Yeah. Because I, I reacted on it rather clearly. Yeah. But I was really also told to fuck off. <laughs> yeah. So what oh, wow. can you do? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, uh, I mean, in these situations, you really feel the overpowering situation of these huge houses. They just can can do like this and, yeah. and crash everything they want <laughs> and they also do that yeah and i've seen many examples where yeah houses do yeah do yeah, that, yeah yeah and um, and that's i mean what i don't like about the fashion world today you're uh, in the middle of wolves and uh, we hope to survive and you hope to don't be, be yeah be uh, chased by a wolf but i mean it happens without yeah. asking huh? and uh, and then you come in situations which you really which i hate and which i don't and um, and I think it's a little bit a shame. Yeah, it's a shame. You should be ashamed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, it's kind of interesting because yeah, even now there's so many stories, and now I'm not sure how aware you are, but on Instagram and Twitter, there's all this like call out culture of like really big companies who take the work of um, up and coming designers, especially with like fast fashion companies where mm -hmm. I don't know, Glenn Martins can make a collection, and then within a week it's in all the Zara stores. Yeah. How bad do you think that is for fashion as a whole? I think it's a pity because exactly what we're talking about fast fashion, they have a lot of money. Yeah. These big things, they have a lot of money, they gain a lot of money. And, and I think that they should have the possibility and also the intelligi intelligence to really put a good designer there and do their own collections. And because now they're they are just copying because that seems to be the easiest thing. But I can I, I don't think that if somebody like Glenn Martins would design something for them, they would also sell it. Right. And then it would be an original product. And uh, I think with, with uh, on one side, of course, you have the basics and you have the commercial pieces. But if you want to do something more fashionable, get a good uh, few young good designers and let them design. And of course they're going to feel also what is hanging in the air. <laughs> but at least they're not going to make identical copies. Yeah. And, um, and, and uh, you see also the success from these collaborations where these companies are doing, like H&M is doing. Yeah. And I, I believe that they would want to do it, they don't have to copy. Yeah, it's... I don't know, it's weird because it's like, with designers, it's so easy for a company that makes billions of dollars to just Okay, instead of copying your work, we'll just bring you on board to yeah. design it. Everyone wins, the yeah. designer gets compensated yes. for something they created. The house, the big company doesn't really lose money because they have yeah. so much money anyway. Of I, don't, I don't know why fashion just doesn't function like that. I would have loved to work together with Virgil yeah. and Louis Vuitton. Yeah. 
I mean, I just I don't understand why that doesn't happen. Yeah, I don't know because they think that copying is the easiest way or the the most effective. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, it's. I feel like okay to me personally. I'll just say me personally. I feel like a lot of designers want to be like respected as you know really good creative designers, for mm-hmm. example. And there are crazy directors that I know of at big houses that just almost like copy what's happened in the past within the house and don't have their own sort of design language type of thing. And I don't know how to combat that because it's like, I almost think sort of the craft and the art of fashion has been a bit lost over the years and now there are many designers who don't even craft clothing. Yeah, yeah, but that's exactly where we focus on in school here. So this this uh, focus on design, on craft, on, on on your own language, that's what we think is extremely important. And uh, I think that will also, at the end, uh, will let survive yeah. fashion. Yeah. And that's why I, I keep on believing in fashion also. I don't don't like fashion because of the in the overproductions and, and the, the industry, the industry and the identical pieces that you see all yeah. over the world <laughs> and then the fast fashion. That's not what I like about fashion. I like the the personal statements, the the the, the small productions, the original pieces, which are for the moment also uh, people are searching for this. Eh? They love to buy a piece which is made in a small quantity, which has personality, which is not a an industrial product which you can find everywhere. The people are searching yeah. for these things. Yeah, so another question I have for you is how do you remember uh, Martin Magella as a person? Because Magella is someone who no one knows what he looks like really. No one really... Obviously. I remember him as a very normal yeah. friend. <laughs> we were together in the same class. We had an uh, uh, incredible time together. We were traveling a lot together and I always found it weird how we disappeared. Yeah. <laughs> I did not see him eh, myself since 1993. Yeah, I, I was listening so to um, the podcast you did on the most. Ah, yeah, and yeah, you yeah, said yeah, that yeah. actually you lost contact yeah, with one yeah, yeah. time. But he, he, we lost contact but he also he, he broke with Antwerp in general. So right. I don't know. I, I mean, he one way or another he was irritated by something. And most of the people didn't see him anymore, so yeah. it's a very weird situation. And yeah. uh, and I know him as somebody who was uh, not hiding at all. Eh? He was very <laughs> open and, and very uh, uh, also communicating very normally. Yeah. In in the eighties, what was Antwerp like? Because going around Antwerp and speaking to people, I've gotten the sense that there was sort of a bubbling creative community. Um, in the streets of Antwerp and it felt like a, a really creative time and I think now they were saying that really commercial stores have come and where there used to be like big communities of creativity it's kind of all fizzled Spread out. Over, yeah. yeah, I mean it was mostly I think very creative in the 90s. So the 80s it was starting a little bit but it was more like a, a small community, students from the school and then a few shops that opened. And there was already some uh, creativity, but in the 90s it really yeah, it right. And that has a, has a, had a lot to do with uh, tourism. So a lot of Japanese people came over in the 90s to visit Antwerp. And it really created a very strong fashion vibe. The, the Asian tourists, also internationally, the, Belgian, yeah. the European yeah. ones also. But there was a lot of people visiting Antwerp. It was also the, uh, the opening of yeah, the first big shops. Uh, we had our shops also in the 90s, which was one of the first concept stores and then with uh, international products, but also a lot of Belgian products. And at that time it was um, yeah, very new, very fresh. It was also a very unknown destination. Yeah. People found it very, very uh, exotic to go to Antwerp. And, uh, and I think they really discovered like a, a small uh, village, city, with a lot of shopping possibilities, a lot of uh, um, beautiful museum, a lot of uh, nice restaurants to eat and terraces to drink on. So it was like a little bit like a dream destination. And, uh, and yeah, of course, that's exactly what fashion tourism liked. 
and um, and then yeah, of course, it, time world was evolving, and then uh, in um, the last ten years, it became much more commercial. The whole feeling, and that has also do I think that the world became more commercial. So, and we lost of course also some shops and and, uh, but I mean I think what what keeps Antwerp now in the picture is the museum, of course, the school is still there. We have a lot of um, designers that uh, uh, graduated here, which meanwhile are spread all over the world. So in fact, uh, the Antwerp spirit went traveling. Yeah. And that is the difference with the 80s. At that time, you had to come here to discover the Antwerp spirit. And now you can find it all over, all the, world. over the world. Yeah. Yeah, so what are your future plans? Because I've heard that this is actually your last year yeah, um, as yeah. the head of the Fashion Academy. Yeah. So what, do you, what, what does the future hold? Yeah, I, I, of course, the last year because I have to stop. Eh? So it's not yeah. something that you decide, it's something in the public school. It's yeah. like that, very 65. But uh, anyway, I, I'm, I'm in good shape, which is... <laughs> <laughs> and I really want to continue, of course, with my collections. And, um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to have more time to do more side projects. Right. And um, I love to create exhibitions, I love to uh, work in different fields. And, and I'm going to continue to do that, of course. Yeah. Um, so the last question I have for you is, for people that aren't familiar with your work, how would you describe your aesthetic or your design language? Uh, Probably a very hard question to answer. <laughs> What should I, I tell? It's um, a Celtic beauty, something like that. Yeah. I think I really want to, to work around beauty, it's very important. And even that probably other people don't see that beauty inside <laughs> it. For me, it is about challenging beauty. I mean, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, so what yes, beauty is, yeah, yeah, of course, is yeah. very different. But, uh, and, and meanwhile, I also like to create some chaos around it and, and play with contrasts and, and, and contradictions and, and bring together different worlds and, and uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, I think it's for an adventure. Yeah. Yeah, so thank you so much for doing the interview, honestly. Um, it's even crazy seeing you. I feel <laughs> like I've seen you on a screen so many times. But never in real. But do you still study? Yeah. Ah. So I'm a fashion journalism student. Ah, okay. In San Martins. Martins. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Because you're not that young. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, you're not 18. No, no, no. No, 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 no. I'm 23. Ah, okay, so okay. I'm... Ah, but you're still young, but you're yeah. very mature. Yeah. Mature student, I guess. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, we also have people of 23. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, no, and then you're ready to conquer the fashion world. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. And meanwhile, you're already doing this, this Yeah, so, so what I do is actually, so I have a YouTube channel, because mm -hmm. I feel like journalism as a whole is changing, and that's why I like my course, because it's called Fashion Communication, Fashion Journalism, and the whole idea is that journalists communicate in different ways. So yeah. on my course, yes, we learn to write, and we write a lot, but we also learn a lot about videography and yeah, photography, yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah. You can communicate in many different ways. Yeah, so it's really adapted yeah. to and our Yeah, so the times. way I communicate is through videos. So I made a YouTube channel talking about like the history of fashion, analyzing fashion, but in video form because I feel like going forward, I like to read books, but not many people my age do. None of their prefer And so to they prefer to listen, they prefer to watch. So yeah. the only way they can learn about these things is if you create that sort of content. Um, so that's kind of the direction I want to go with journalism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, it's my yeah. pleasure.